good to meet you again. I have been interacting so many times around Ebola in North Kivu. And uh, as you rightly said, this new outbreak is happening in Ecuador, which is a different context with very limited resources and difficulties to move from one area to another. You have to move from by boat, by helicopter, to make sure that you can implement the right intervention. So in terms of operation, we have you now seven health zones affected, although six are only active right now. It means decentralizing operation to all those health zones, making sure that we have all the necessary capacity in terms of investigation, in terms of isolation, treatment, contact tracing, and vaccination. And uh, so we have a good team on the ground composed by Congolese, WHO staff we already had in Congo, some from North Kivu, others from Kinshasa, and a number of partners like uh, MSF, UNICEF, uh, IFRC working around various pillars. So we still have uh, some challenges in terms of alert, mainly alert related to death body, because it's very important to make sure that our surveillance pick up all the alert, not only from the health facilities and alert, alert in the community, but also death body. And uh, so we are scaling up, still have important gaps in terms of operation because of the difficulties to move around the area. So we continue monitoring the situation and having a daily briefing from the ground and making sure that all partners scale up in the area of responsibility. So it's challenging in the context of COVID because in the capital city in Kinshasa, many people are focusing on COVID-19. So making sure that they don't, don't play Ebola is extremely important. We need also from the national side to scale up operation in all areas. Thank you. Um, and if I j just might just add some of, some of the numbers, Ellen, we've had three new cases over the weekend. We now have 60 uh, Ebola virus uh, cases, uh, with 56 of those confirmed for probable, including 24 deaths. I think, uh, and as uh, as Sose alluded to, uh, the worrying aspects of, of this response in that there have been cases in 21 health areas across seven health zones. So while the numbers are very low, the disease is quite dispersed. Um, and five or seven of those health zones have had cases in the last four days, which means the disease is active, it's not old. So what we have is active disease uh, in, in, f in five health zones uh, across a wide geographic area. Uh, again, worrying is that there are still nine cases who are still in the community and there are real challenges in terms of community engagement and convincing people to come for care in Ebola treatment centres. And of the overall period of terms of exposures, and again, this may go back to the whole issue of case finding and contact tracing and getting the information you need to know where and what the transmission factors are. It is interesting to me that in this case, in the most extreme situation of logistics, uh, probably in, in the world, uh, the data that comes in daily from the surveillance teams you know, tells us that for the people who've been exposed um, uh, over the, 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 the last 21 days, for example, the exposures, but over one in three people have been exposed at a funeral event. Uh, uh, just over 10% have been, 11% have been exposed through nosocomial or in the in the healthcare system, um, and 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 a lot uh, further number of people uh, uh, have been exposed in a family context. So, the information you glean from case investigation and contact tracing tells you who's at risk, and we're able to say for a very remote part of Congo, the a big risk factor in this particular clusters of cases is funeral practice and we're working very closely with communities then to really work with them on the funeral process and on engaging with them on how to make that practice safer. It is very hard to engage uh, in generalities. When you work with communities, you must be able to engage on specifics. Getting good data from case and cluster investigation gives you the specific data that allows you to identify the risk factors and then engage positively with communities on how to reduce those risk factors. This is epidemiology and public health in action. If we can do this in a remote, remote part of Congo, if we could do this in, in the middle of a war zone in North Kivu, we can do this for COVID-19. 
it is not impossible. Many countries have demonstrated that uh, all over the world. So I think uh, even though we don't have perfect data from the field, and so they can speak to some of the challenges we face logistically and operationally, the fact that we have these data, we know where our problems are in the field. We know where our hotspots are. We know what's driving transmission in those communities. And that allows us and gives us the basis to intervene and, uh, and to make a difference. So while the situation in Congo remains of concern, what reassures me at the moment is that we're improving in community engagement. There are many partners on the ground. Uh, and again, we'd like to thank our partners, particularly in the Red Cross movement and others who once again are working with local teams in terms of safe and dignified burial, our colleagues in UNICEF who are working on communications, our colleagues in the UN system working on coordination, the World Food Programme working on uh, logistics and support to base camps. But most of all, the frontline health workers of Congo, the Congolese doctors, nurses, hygienists, community engagement specialists who make up the vast majority of the front line in this response. And uh, again, our thanks to the government, the Ministry of Health and the Institut National de Recherche Biologique, INRB, for their leadership in this response. And thank you, Helen, for your question, which really ties together much of what we have been trying